All right, let's go ahead and open up to John. We're going to introduce here, we're by looking back at what we've been doing the last couple of weeks uh, with those two major events uh, in the life of Jacob. We looked at the first one, uh, and the reason why we're doing this, well, let's look at the first one. I uh, look at John 1, 51, and he said to unto him, Verily, verily, I say unto you, Hereafter ye shall see heaven open, and the angels of God ascending and descending upon the Son of Man. And of course, that's that. Uh, he's, he's alluding back to that uh, occurrence with Jacob uh, when he left the land. Remember, he was, he's called Jacob. He's called the, the heel grabber. Uh, because, and the idea there is he grabs people's heel and lifts them up so that they trip, they stumble, they fall. Uh, is a trickster, a deceiver, that kind of, and that becomes then to be kind of the trickster uh, or deceiver concept. Maybe today uh, we would be more inclined to say something like, you know, stick out your foot in front of someone uh, so that they uh, take a spin or drop something. I remember once when I was a kid, there was art class and you had to go back to the back room where you, the art piece of art was and bring it up to the front. And one of my fellow students, while I'm carrying this big art project down the hall, he stuck his foot out in front of me and I took for a spill and there went my art project. Uh, well, that's kind of the kind of person Jacob was. He was grabbing people's heels, sticking his foot out in front of people. He spent his whole life up to this point, especially his time uh, before leaving the land, his time with Laban, and up to the point he's ready to return to the land uh, as uh, the one who's constantly uh, trying to outsmart everyone else, trying to get uh, his, uh, use other people for his own uh, benefit, uh, and now uh, he's going to run into someone that he can't wrestle with and win against anyway. Uh, and so that's what we're gonna look at today. That's gonna lead into now this title, the last, ver the last phrase here in verse 51, the Son of Man title. Very important uh, title. And basically by the time we get done today, we'll be ready to really look at that title uh, over the next week or two. Uh, but first, uh, that's the first uh, thing we want to look at here, that was that first encounter uh, that God had with, a, with uh, Jacob. Uh, he, he deceives Esau out of his birthright, out of his, that blessing, and he's exiled from the land. If, and remember, uh, he goes to leave the land. Rebecca sends him out of the lamb, land, and remember what she said? She said, go, go to Uncle Laban for a few days. Well, he's there 20 years because as it turns out, Uncle Laban is even trickier uh, and more of a heel grabber than Jacob is. Uh, and so he ends up staying there for 20 years. Uh, and then we get to the second event, major encounter with God on his way back to the land. Uh, at that Bethel, what the, the, the vision we just saw, the stairway to heaven vision, he's leaving the land. God reconfirms the Abrahamic covenant with him. He reconfirms that it will be through Jacob and his seed that the land will belong. Uh, and his, that his seed will be as the uh, stars of the sky, the dust of the earth, the sand of the sea, innumerable, multiplied seed. Uh, and through that seed, he's going to form a nation. And through that nation, he's going to bless the whole world. The nation, of course, is Israel. Then he gets exiled out of the land, goes with Uncle Laban for 20 years. Uh, now he's coming back in the land, and we have our second encounter. And that's over here in, verse, in John 1, verse 47. So let's just pick up on that, uh, and we'll get the whole picture here. Verse 47, Jesus saw Nathanael coming to him and said of him, Behold, an Israelite indeed, and is a true Israelite, in whom is no guile. Uh, and so now when he returns from Jacob, Jacob returns to the land from Uncle Laban, uh, he's, in spite of the fact uh, Laban took advantage of him, outsmarted him, trickstered him, uh, God still took care of him, preserved him as he promised at Bethel when he left the land at that uh, ladder vision, ladder dream, uh, and he's multiplied him. He's coming back now into the land with this huge provision of riches. He comes back into the land and he's afraid of Esau. 
uh, and, be, and to set the groundwork here, he gets to the point on the, just on the other side of the Jordan to, add, to come into the land, and there's a camp of angels, a host of angels. You know what a host is? It's an army. An army of angels is there. And what does Jacob do? He first tries to deal with Esau based on his own schemes. Uh, and remember what he does there. He has all those riches. He's going to say, try to appease Esau, make a deal with Esau, uh, and send over these gifts in waves. I guess you could kind of see waves. I don't remember what the waves of gifts are. So he sends over, you know, the, 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 can the 70 camels or something and the gifts associated with them. And then he's, he, in his mind, in his schemes, he's like, wow, Esau's going to be so appeased with that and so uh, thrilled with that that before he finishes with the, uh, let's say, camels, he's going to send over a wave of flocks and then he's going to follow it with another wave of flocks and gifts and and servants, and he's going to just overawe uh, Esau with this. And he's got this whole scheme that he's going to do through his own flesh. He's got an army of angels sitting right over there in the other camp. But he's going to, he first he's going to try his own schemes. Uh, and remember, this is what went wrong at Sinai. Jacob's made of the same frag, uh, fabric as the Israelites uh, when they came out of Egypt and that all fallen humanity is carved out of. Uh, they came out of Egypt. God just destroyed the biggest empire in the world at that time. He destroyed its army. He fed two to three million people through the wilderness, gave them water, fed them, protected them, destroyed their enemies, brought them all the way uh, to the mount and they're already the Midianites the Gentile uh, Midianites are already fellowshipping together with the Israelites worshiping the one true God and it's all before they ever got to that law and the Mount Sinai and the law he's already made them into the nation he wanted them to be and he sums it up and he says I carried you along as on eagles wings and brought you to myself and what they sh should have said, what Jacob should have said, he should have gone to God first, uh, what Jacob and what Israel said they would do instead, we'll try it on our own first. We'll try it our own way first. God, they should have said, I'm not getting off this eagle. You got to keep flying us along. You've got to keep doing everything for us. Instead, they get to Sinai, they jump off the eagle and they say, we, we want to do it ourselves. We'll do it ourselves. Uh, and of course, that's set in motion. And here we have Jacob, uh, which is what, uh, 400, let's say, three or 400 years before uh, the Israelites coming out of Egypt. They're made out of the same fa fabric. Here, Jacob has an army of angels. I haven't said that too many times, have I? And he's still going to try and accomplish this thing with Esau through his own schemes. Well, so he sends these waves of gifts over. He's going to appease Jacob. He's going to make a deal with Jacob. He's going to make a treaty. He's going to do all this stuff uh, with Esau. Uh, and uh, the servant comes back uh, after that little plan. He says, well, Esau's on the way and he's got 400 men. Now Jacob is brought to the end of his means. He's beginning to think his little schemes are crashing. They're falling apart. And then he prays to God. Then he talks to God. Then he reminds God of the promises he made uh, to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Then he falls on the grace resident in his Jehovah name. Then he goes to God. And of course, what a Jacob and what Israel needed to learn is they need to just skip the middle step, doing it on their own, and just go to God. Just rely on God, and he'll take care of it for them. So you have uh, J Jacob finally goes to prayer, asking for deliverance uh, from God, a protection from God. God answers the prayer for deliverance with a face-to-face -face encounter uh, with blessings that ensured victory over men, uh, but only after breaking his own strength to rely on God's strength. Remember that sets in motion. Uh, he's going to struggle uh, with a man all night long, and we saw last time that man turns out to be God. Uh, and he has a face-to-face -face encounter with God. And what we want to do now is take this, I just re, kind of rehearsing uh, these two accounts because they're going to play a pivotal role in the gospel accounts, especially in our gospel of John, uh, as, we get, as we go to that. So we're going to tie that all together, bring the two uh, 
passages together tonight. So just to start it off, it's just important to know this is what God would do with Jacob in the courses of, of punishment. Jacob meaning Israel uh, in the courses of punishment, disabling them so that they will rely on him to be the true, to be the true Israel, he, so that he can create, create of them Israel indeed, his own Israel, true Israel. First, God would disable Israel under the captivities to the Gentiles and those five courses of punishment. Uh, and one day he's going to bring them back to himself and they will rely on him and enter into uh, the land, into the land uh, that he has for them. It might be a good idea to look at our timeline here. Uh, here we have the courses of punishment, first course of punishment, second, third, fourth, fifth course of punishment. Uh, the first four installments of the five courses of punishment get us through the earthly ministry of Christ. And now there's only one installment, one that seven year period in Daniel's time schedule we call the tribulation period. That's the only thing left of the fifth course of punishment. And what God was doing here, remember uh, at, when he, they went under those courses of punishment, well, when they went under the law, they came out of the law, what'd they do? They went right to the golden calf incident. They broke the whole law, hopelessly. God said, get out of the way, I gotta go down and consume them. Get out of the way, Moses. I got to go down and consume them, my vengeance and wrath. That's what the law called for. And I'll, create, I'll show mercy to Moses and create the nation out of Moses. Instead, remember Moses appealed to him on the basis of the grace resident in his Jehovah name. And instead of going down to consume them, what did he do? He went down in his mercy and grace and put them in an education program. That's what he's doing with Jacob struggling all night long. He's going to struggle now. That was kind of a picture or representation of what he's going to do with the nation of Israel in these five courses of punishment. He's going to keep struggling with the nation of Israel. He's going to struggle with them through the first course of punishment, the second course of punishment, the third course of punishment, the fourth and fifth course of punishment. It's going to reach the absolute darkness of night, and he's going to just keep struggling with them. And what he's trying to do, what he tried to do with Jacob, and what he's trying to do with the nation of Israel is bring them to the end of their own power. Bring them to the end of their own abilities. Make them realize they can't do anything on their own. God has to do it for them. And he brings them in these courses of punishment, a struggling with them, uh, just as he's struggling with Je Jacob all night long. Uh, he didn't need to struggle with Jacob all night long. This is the God man. Uh, he could have just gone uh, the night before, gone and, and popped his hip out of joint or broke his ligament or whatever he did there, uh, and that would have been the end of it. But he struggled with them all day, night long because he wants him, them to come <clears throat> to the end, realize at the, they need to come to the end of their own power. They need to rely on him. And when they come through these five courses of punishment, God struggles and struggles. He's struggling all night with them uh, for all these years. And these five courses of punishment, they're going to be struggling out in this tribulation period. And in that tribulation period, that believing remnant of Israel is going to be persecuted by the apostate nation of Israel and scattered out in the world, be taken captive by the Gentile nations. And they're going to be persecuted by the Gentile nations. And they're going to be squeezed and struggled with so much, they're going to reach uh, the end of their strength. It's as though God had popped out their hip, broken their ligament in their leg. They're going to reach the point. And when that happens at the end of this tribulation period, they're going to fall on the grace resident in his Jehovah name. They're going to look on him and fall on his grace. They're going to say, treat us graciously. They're going to say what they should have said back at Sinai, and they should have said, we're not getting off this eagle. You've got to just keep flying us along, and you have to do everything for us. And they are going to. What they gave the wrong, and they failed the test at Sinai, they are, they're going to pass the test out here at Christ's second coming. That's that struggling concept. That's those courses of punishment he's going to put them in. He could have just gone down and consumed him and started over with Moses. Instead, he put him just like he could have done with Jacob. He could have gone down and whacked him on the head at the moment he got there. 
but he's going to struggle with them. He's going to try and bring them to the end of their own power. What they need to realize is God's blessings are given, are, are freely given. Uh, they're not gained by deceit or trickery uh, or anything like that. But he, so he's struggling with them in these courses of punishment to bring them to the end of their own way. And so when you get to that encounter uh, with Jacob, when you get to the encounter with Jacob, uh, you see that now he does that. He struggles all night long. Jacob's still struggling. And so God finally uh, ends it with the popping of the hip or breaking of the ligament, whatever, whatever exactly happened there, uh, and drained him of his resources. And now all Jacob has left to do is cling to the Lord for a blessing. And he gets his blessing, <clears throat> and he gets his blessing. Uh, and uh, how does it remember the naming that goes on there? Uh, Jacob, he's, before he'll bless Jacob, what does he make Jacob do? He makes Jacob admit who he is. Who are you? I'm Jacob, the deceiver, the heel grabber, the one that trips everyone up for their own benefit. I'm the one that deceived uh, Esau out of that gets him to acknowledge who he is, and we're going to see that tie in uh, to our Gospel of John and the, the Christ's earthly ministry. Uh, and he asks him, who are you? And uh, the Lord, of course, uh, says, you shouldn't have to ask who I am. You know who I am. I'm the one that met with you when you left the land. I said I'd be here when you got back with the land. You just saw my camp, my host, my army of angels over here. You know who I am. I'm the Lord. I'm the one that promised I would take care of you and bring you back into the land. And now, he says, I'm going to rename you. Uh, now that you've been brought, I've struggled with you, I've brought you to the end of your own means, and now you're at the point where all you can do is fall on me and ask me for a blessing. Now I'm going to bless you, and I'm going to give you a new name, Israel. Now let's go back, to, or let's go to John. And now when you read verse 47 again. Jesus saw Nathanael, this is John 1 verse 47. Jesus saw Nathanael coming to him and said to him, Behold, an Israelite indeed, in one whom is no guile, no deceit, no Jacob. Nathanael, he's looking, he comes along, and he looks into the very core of Nathanael's being supernaturally looks into, he hasn't met him before uh, personally, he doesn't know who he is, and he looks into his being and he says, ah, you're a Jacob without guile, you're a true Israelite indeed, you're a true Israel. And see, that's what the whole nation is going to become. They're going to, they need that, the whole nation needs to switch from being a Jacob with guile uh, to an Israel without guile who just relies and clings to the Lord for, their, for a blessing. And so you get that, that's what ties into that second thing. And he identifies, Nathaniel skips the Jacob stage. He's already at the Israel stage. He's already one who's going to be responsive. He's already a member of the believing remnant. Uh, he's already a true Israelite uh, in the sense of the, a member of that believing remnant through which God's going to deliver uh, into the kingdom, plant in the land, and recreate the true, the, his nation of Israel, out of that believing remnant made of, of Israelites indeed, uh, and raise them, restore the nation above all other nations, and bless the world with and through them. And he gives them this name. He sees into the core of his being, and we know uh, this uh, and then he's going to show, we're not going to go into this with the fig tree, but that's the third thing that comes up here uh, in this, this end of chapter 1 with Nathaniel is the fig tree. We talked about that as a reference uh, to the messy king and the messianic, the king, king in the kingdom, the messiah and the messianic kingdom. And that's when Nathaniel responds, this is someone who knows who I am supernaturally on the inside, probably knows uh, him better than Nathaniel knows himself. He knows what I was doing before in the past. And we already read, he knows what Nathaniel's going to be doing in the future. 
and Nathaniel just breaks out with this, uh, this testimony, thou art the, the son of God, the king of Israel. And I guess what we should take a look at here uh, is if Nathaniel is tying all these things together, so should we. As we go through the disciples' testimony here, the one who is the fulfiller of the Old Testament, we read that over uh, earlier, that's how Philip uh, persuaded Nathaniel to go and come and see about Jesus. And the one who is the fulfiller of the Old Testament, the one that Moses and the prophets spoke about, the one who knows the hearts and souls of men, the one who is the Christ, the Messiah, the one who is the God, uh, God the Son, uh, and the King of Israel, the one, this is the one who struggled with Jacob 2,000 years ago, roughly. 2,000 years ago. He's the one that she was, appeared to Jacob 2,000 years ago when at Bethel uh, on, as uh, the one talking to him on top of that stairway, looking down, talking with him on that stairway uh, that leads into heaven, that connected heaven and earth, God and man, with the angels ascending and descending. The one who's doing that, the one who does all that, the one that's been involved in all those things, all the way back to Jacob and his dream and his renaming, uh, and the one that Moses and the prophets have been speaking about, the one that David spoke about in Psalm 2, the Son of God who is also the King of Israel, the one uh, who has all-knowing, all-seeing eyes that can penetrate into the soul of a human, that one is here now with Nathaniel and the other disciples and the nation of Israel. That one has a face-to-face -face interaction with him. Like Jacob, the believing remnant would need to learn that deliverance doesn't come by compromising or accommodating the enemy. We saw that with Jacob and Esau trying to accommodate, trying to appease uh, Esau. Uh, God already told him he was gonna bring him back in the land safely. Uh, see, all the stuff Jacob was doing was just fleshly schemes. God already told him he was going to do that. God already told Rebekah at the birth of Jacob and Esau that Esau was going to serve Jacob. They didn't need to do all that deception and all that trickery. God already said that was going to happen. See, we keep trying to... Uh, even it, it, It's a sin even to try to accomplish God's goals through our own flesh. And what Jacob and what Israel, and this was here, you have an inner uh, dispensational truth, I'd say, what's true of the members of the body of Christ, we have to stop doing things by even the goals of God, accomplishing the goals of God through the flesh. We need to just rely on the Lord to do it for us, in and through us. And that's what Jacob need to learn too. They're going to, throughout Israel's history, uh, they're going to be atta attacked by one country and they'll try and make treaties with others. They're going to be attacked by the Assyrians uh, and they're going to go and try and make a treaty, a treaty with Egypt. So Egypt will come and fight the Assyrians for them and they're going to have all these other little treaties and they think they're going to, they, they get protected in that way. Uh, and God's like, why don't you just come to me? And they don't. The same, and don't, we can't sit here and say, well, how could they be so foolish or something? We, it's what we do every second of every day. We do it on our own. We come up with our own schemes. Uh, and even if they're to try to accomplish the goals of God, we try and do it our own way instead of let God do it in and through us. Uh, and they try to rely, they make treaties with other countries to protect themselves, to deliver themselves. They get all these schemes and they need to throw all that away. When they get to the end of that tribulation period and planted in the land and created a new nation, they're going to understand that. Uh, and they're going to, uh, God's going to do everything for them. Uh, and that believing remnant, I guess we can extend it a little further. Uh, we already see this happening in the Gospel of John. Uh, the main point of the gospel accounts and the earthly ministry of Christ is John's coming on the scene now, to, and Jesus too, uh, to call that believing remnant out of the apostate nation uh, and uh, call them out. And that's the other thing they're going to have to do. Don't, that's what James, remember when we did the book of James, he's warned them, don't compromise with the world and don't compromise with the vain religious system of Israel. 
You have to be separate from that. Uh, stay uh, within the believing remnant of Israel, uh, loving and helping and serving one another, looking toward the coming of Christ. They need to be separate, uh, not rely or accommodate uh, or compromise with that vain religious system. Every, if Israel's gonna be the nation uh, he designed her to be, he's gonna have to do everything for them. So let's tie this all together now. This account, these two accounts uh, in Jacob's history with uh, the Gospel of John. Now let's just go through a few of these things. First thing to know, we're going to especially focus uh, at the beginning here on this renaming of Jacob, the struggle. Uh, and first of all, the thing to remember is it happened before he re-entered uh, the promised land. Uh, that ties into our gospel accounts because when John the Baptist comes on the scene baptizing, you know what he does? He goes to the other side of the Jordan. He's going to, he's calling out the true Israel, the Israel indeed, uh, the Nathaniels. Uh, he's calling them out and he's out of the vain religious system and the apostate nation. He's calling them out and he's taking them to the other side of the Jordan, where he's uh, Jordan. And he's uh, calling on them to participate in Israel's national repentance for sins, Israel's national confession of sins, Israel's uh, national and entering into na Israel's national cleansing program beginning with the water baptism of John and he takes him to the other side of the Jordan. He takes him to over by where Joshua way back when they first entered the land entered the land. Takes him on the other side. He's going to bring the nation in again. The nation that's there now isn't God's Israel indeed. The believing remnant of Israel is going to be God's Israel indeed. True Israel. Uh, and he's going to usher them in. So you see, it's half, it starts out on the other side of the Jordan, and they're going to come over it just like Joshua did. Uh, and, of course, that's going to be ultimately fulfilled out uh, at the end of that tribulation period. It involves the renaming. There's a lot of renaming going on here. Uh, I think I pointed out last week we were in the Genesis uh, uh, Jacob renames a couple of the areas, a couple of the cities. Luz, he renames Bethel uh, and the place, remember the two camps? You had the uh, Jacob's camp uh, and the angel's camp and he named that. Uh, I can, I don't know how to pronounce it, so I'm just a Methaniel or some such thing, but he names that. The point is, he's, there's a lot of naming going on. God's reclaiming the land and the people. He's reclaiming it. When you name something, you take uh, kind of control and ownership over it. And he's uh, renaming. And here we have some renaming. Uh, and then, of course, you had uh, the renaming of Ju uh, Jacob uh, from Jacob to Israel, from uh, hip grabber, or not hip grabber, heel grabber and deceiver and trickster to uh, Israel. Prince of God, uh, the one God fights for. See, that's what they needed to realize. If God didn't fight for them, no matter what their schemes were, no matter what they tried to do on their own, no matter who they tried to appease or what alliances they tried to make with other gentiles, none of that is going to work. God has to fight for them. They have to just, without any power, cling to God and ask for a blessing. Fall on the grace, we might say, fall on the grace resident in his Jehovah name. Well, in our account here uh, in John, we first of all, we could think of, uh, while he didn't rename Nathaniel, he did identify his true name. Uh, he is, uh, uh, Nathaniel is an Israelite indeed. He's a true Israelite. Uh, he's not a Jacob with guile. He's a Jacob without guile, which is the name for that is an Israel, an Israelite. But we also saw an actual renaming here in verse uh, 41, where uh, <clears throat> Andrew finds his own brother, Simon, uh, and he finds his own brother, verse 41, and saith unto him, We have found Messiah, which is being interpreted the Christ. And he brought him to Jesus. And when Jesus beheld him, he said, Thou art Simon, the son of Jonah. Thou shalt be called Cephas, uh, which being interpreted as a stone. So here you have a renaming of Simon uh, to Cephas, to Peter. 
You have uh, Nathaniel identified by his true name, an Israelite indeed. And so you have this renaming going on, same thing you had similar to what you had in the Genesis account. Uh, not only that, uh, but uh, in uh, answer to the deliverance for prayer, uh, God gave Jacob uh, a faith. He, the way God answered Jacob's prayer for deliverance from Esau was a face-to-face -face encounter with the God-man, with a man who turned out to be God. Uh, he saw him face to face, uh, and he names, oh, that's another naming that went on. Uh, he named Penuel, uh, God, I, God, I was face to face with God and survived. Uh, and so he gives, a, answers that prayer with a face to face concept, uh, face to face encounter. Uh, and with Israel now, he's as answering Simeon's and Anna, uh, Anna's uh, and Zacharias's and uh, probably Mary and Joseph's and uh, John the Baptist and Nathaniel's perhaps prayer here uh, to deliver the nation of Israel through a faith. Now he's giving them, he's answering their prayer with a face-to-face -face encounter with the God-man. Jacob wrestled with the God-man uh, all night, uh, and, and the whole time he didn't know who he was. Who, who are you? Uh, what's your name? Uh, and uh, the disciples in our account here in John, they're going to be wrestling with the God-man, the Lord Jesus Christ, uh, and they're not going to understand completely who he is. It's going to be a growth. It's a, we, I, we talked about this earlier, this uh, journey of faith. They're going to believe as things unfold. Uh, this, see, this is new information. They're not going to get all this right up front. Uh, and many times it's, it's going to, uh, I would say it's comical, but it's not really comical. It's a little sad as well, but uh, they'll say something magnificent like Peter does uh, in Matthew 16. He says, thou art the Christ, the son of the living God. And then what, is it, what happens a few, just a few verses later in that same chapter? Uh, Jesus has to turn around and say to Peter, get thee behind me, Satan, because he's trying to counteract with his own plans and purposes uh, Christ's announcement of his suffering, death, and resurrection in the upcoming days. So they kind of, what we're going to see a lot, this isn't going to be a straight ascent on an airplane taking, like an airplane taking off. This is going to be more like a roller coaster ride. And you just think they're starting to get it, and then they kind of fall. But this is all new to them. Uh, there's a, these are just regular humans like, like us. And if you think this is unusual, just keep in mind uh, that we've had Pauline Grace Mystery Truth, God's Word through Paul, uh, for 2,000 years clearly stated in the full revelation of God's Word. And how many Christians know anything about it today? Very few, <laughs> very, very few uh, know anything uh, about it at all. So you can't be too surprised if this new information that these people are having a little hard, they don't know what to do with it. They, they don't make all the right ramifications and all the right, uh, all the end, what they all mean in the end and how they're all going to play out. Uh, but uh, they're going to be uh, struggling too and they're not always going to really understand who they're struggling with. Just like Jacob, he struggled with the God man all night long. And even when the daylight came, he didn't know who he was. Who are you? And God reveals himself to him. Uh, I would suggest that the disciples and is, are going to be struggling with the God-man, the Lord Jesus Christ, in our earthly ministry account here. Uh, and they're going to be learning about who he is as we go through this account. We, I just mentioned uh, Peter uh, in, in um, Matthew 16. Let's look at one more. John 14, right here in John, John 14, John 14, verse 9, but let's read a little before that so we know what we're talking about here. Uh, look at verse 6. We'll pick it up at verse 6. Jesus saith unto him, I am. Remember, when I say it like I am, remember, I'm going to say, if I say I'm in the contraction, uh, then there's nothing special about it. If I say I am, uh, that's the terms of deity, that's that divine name. 
Jesus saith unto him, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh to unto the Father but by me. If ye had known me, ye should have known the Father also. And from henceforth ye know him and have seen him. They've actually seen him. Uh, they, he's given them a face-to-face -face encounter uh, with God. Philip said, verse 8, unto the Lord, show us the Father, and it sufficeth us. And Jesus said unto him, have I been so long with you, and yet hast thou not known me, Philip? He that hath seen me hath seen the Father. How sayest thou then, show us the Father? So just as Jacob, uh, his prayer for deliverance uh, was answered, by a face-to-face -face encounter with the God-man, uh, and then he struggled with him all night long wondering who this was. Uh, that's kind of be the struggling we're gonna see start happening here in John's account. Uh, and uh, we're gonna see them at times recognize this is God the Son. We've just heard some of the testimony from the disciples in chapter one. But it's gonna be that roller coaster. It's gonna seem like they got it, and then the very next verses, they'll show they didn't really understand what they were saying. Uh, just like we, we do with God's word today. Uh, let's not make this a special uh, situation. They're just humans, regular people, uh, and they're all trying to have, operate through the flesh and have their own ideas about the way things should get done, like Jacob had his idea for how he's gonna appease Esau. Uh, but uh, we have to get in line with God and his word. And that's not always smooth sailing. Sometimes that's more like a rough and choppy, uh, rough and choppy sea. All right, so Jacob clung to God through it all. Uh, even after he was brought to the end of his own strength, even after he was in pain and his hip popped out or his ligament cut or broke or whatever happened there, uh, Jacob kept clinging to God through it all. Uh, and the believing remnant of Israel, the disciples, uh, the, the believing remnant of Israel, the disciples are gonna continue to cling to him as well. So let's look at an example of that. We read just, uh, let's read about Peter here. Go to John 6, John 6, 68. Uh, and verse 66, from that time, many of his disciples went back and walked no more with him. Now that's interesting, we'll explore that when we get to it. But now, but look at these, uh, this believing remnant, these core disciples uh, that are with Jesus here. Then Je said Jesus unto the 12, will ye also go away? Then Simon Peter answered him, Lord, to whom shall we go? Thou hast the words of eternal life. And we believe and are sure that thou art the Christ, the son of the living God. Uh, and so you see the 12, the disciples uh, the, uh, represented in that 12, they are going to cling to him. They're not going to let him go. They're going to uh, cling, continue with him. Who else has the words of eternal life? Who else would we go to? Uh, see, they've got that, and they're going to cling to him. The man asked Jacob what is his name, forcing him to reveal uh, the, his whole nature, sinful deceiver. Uh, because they, by enforcing Jacob back in Genesis 32 to reveal, to say who he is, he has to say, uh, say, uh, say what his name is, is to say who he is. Because Jacob means uh, deceiver, trickster, one with guile. God first makes him acknowledge who he is. Uh, it's the same thing with John the Baptist. He's calling out that believing remnant of Israel. He's calling on them to acknowledge uh, and confess who they are. He wants the nation to confess and acknowledge that they're in the predicament they're in, in these five courses of punishment, uh, in that uh, timeline, we won't go back to it, but in that fifth course of punishment, Christ's earthly ministry is the fourth installment, uh, and they need, they're under Gentile rule. The nation is in, we saw in um, our Matthew study, in, in Matthew uh, three and four there, uh, we saw that uh, the nation is in utter and complete ruin. Uh, there's uh, demons in the land. There's hunger in the land. There's no righteousness in the land. They're ruled by a vain religious system that's ruled by the Gentiles, that's ruled by Satan. The land's in total ruin. The nation is in total ruin. 
and he, John the Baptist comes on, he's calling out that believing remnant, and he wants the nation to acknowledge why they're in this predicament. It's not because God has failed, it's because of their rebelliousness and sin. Uh, and he calls them out to participate and to acknowledge Israel's national sin, Israel's national rebellion, Israel's national need for confession and repentance, Israel's national need to enter into a God's cleansing program, beginning with John the Baptist water baptism, going on to the spirit baptism, which we had a foretaste of at Pentecost, and on and through that fiery baptism that they're going to preserve and uh, go through in that tribulation period. And when they come out of those three baptisms, that cleansing program, they're going to be a purified people of God. God's going to usher them into the land, plant them in the land, and create the true Israel out of them. And we see that all uh, in, this, in this Jacob encounter. He struggles with Jacob to remove self-dependence, self-reliance, coming up with his own schemes and doing it his own way, doing it himself. Uh, and he wants him to be dependent on him. Uh, in Israel's prophetic program, we would say to fall on the grace resident in his Jehovah name to rely on him to do everything for him. I, and that's what John, of course, we already looked at this in those I am uh, Je Jehovah names, uh, the true God of Israel. Uh, and he wants to do everything for them. It's the only way they're going to be the people they uh, desire to be. All right, so the bottom line here is here is as Jacob, as the deceiver, uh, as uh, the deceiver, as the, the one who grabs people's heels in order to get them to stumble and fall uh, for his own benefit to get, a, get something for himself. Uh, he used God's things for his own fleshly pursuit. Once he's renamed Israel, and you see that's what the nation is doing as well. See, the Jacob represents the nation. Then you have when Jacob's name is changed to Israel, Prince of God, the one God fights for, he will use God's things for God's purposes. And that's why it had to happen before he re-entered the land and it, for Jacob. Uh, and it's going to have to happen before that believing remnant re-enters the land as well out there at the end of that tribulation period. So you have a total correlation here. Uh, everything in the, in the Jacob account matches up with what's beginning to happen in the gospel accounts and what's going to be ultimately fulfilled out uh, in that at the end of that tribulation period at his second coming. The name Israel uh, would remind uh, when he changed his name from Jacob to Israel, <clears throat> the name Israel would remind the nation that in overcoming in this fight with God and men, uh, they could overcome all things. If he could wrestle with God and survive, uh, he'll have no problem wrestling with men and survive because uh, God's going to do it for him. They, would, they could overcome everything, all things, now relying on God's power rather than their own power power. And let's just look at a couple examples of this. Go to John. Uh, we'll just stick with, maybe we won't look at all these, but go to look how John over and over is going to talk about this overcoming. With Jacob, he said, I have struggled and met face to face with God and been preserved. Uh, J John's going to pick that up and in his talk, he's, it's going to be the word overcome. Uh, preserved, overcome, uh, and he's going to talk about overcoming. So let's go to John 16, 33. John 16, 33, he's his final words with his, uh, this core group of disciples, the, the 12 here. Look at verse 33. Let's, uh, verse, yeah, I guess we'll just read for 33. These things I have spoken unto you that in me you might have peace. In the world you shall have tribulation, uh, but be of good cheer. 
So now he's telling them, uh, in the world you're going to have tribulation, and of course, uh, what's going we expand that out and that tribulation period, that final uh, seven-year period of Daniel's time schedule. In the world, you're going to go through this time of tribulation, this tribulation period, uh, and it's going to be uh, the, the it, especially that last half, the worst time in the history of the world, and the whole purpose of everything is trying to stamp you guys out, stamp God and Christ, the Messiah, and his people out before he comes and ushers them into the kingdom. And they're going to be persecuted, by, not only by the Gentiles, they're going to be persecuted by the apostate nation. They're going to be scattered among the Gentiles, held captive by enemy Gentiles. They're going to be persecuted, and they're going to go trials and tribulations. But look what Jesus says here. He says, I say these things to you so you're ready. In the midst of all that, have peace. This is that you might have peace and be of good cheer. How hard is that, isn't it? Uh, that's no easier, going to be easier for them than it is for us. Uh, but be of good cheer. Uh, be, you're going to go through this tribulation period. You're going to be persecuted. You're going to be brought to the end of your own power, just like Jacob was. But keep relying on me. Keep clinging to me. Keep demanding of me to be whatever you need me to be. And why is that going to work? Look at the last uh, phrase of verse 33. I have overcome the world. He's overcoming. He's going to overcome the world. Uh, and he has overcome the world. So since they belong to him, they've overcome the world. And look how he stretches that. We'll look at uh, one more example here. Go to 1 John now. 1 John. 1 John chapter 2 and look how he describes again I'm not going in the background of all these passages I just want you to see the terminology this overcoming meeting God face to face entering a relationship with him he's an overcomer so they're an overcomer verse 13 I write unto you uh, fathers because you have known uh, known him that is from the beginning. I write unto you, young men, because ye have overcome the wicked one. Uh, so there's the overcoming concept again. Uh, and I write unto you, little children, because you have known the Father. I have written unto you, fathers, because you have known him that is from the beginning. I have written unto you, young men, because ye are strong, and the word of God abides in you, and ye have overcome the wicked one. He says it twice there. He overcomes. And he's going to refer to this overcoming concept over and over. Uh, I, there's some references in Revelation. We won't turn there. Uh, but they can be, they're overcomers. They've met God face to face uh, and survived, which means that now they can survive anything else. If they've survived the one and is now being blessed by the one who's overcome the world, well, then the trials and tribulations of the world can't overcome them. They're going to overcome the world as Christ, over, because Christ, they belong to Christ, and Christ has overcome the world. If they see God face to face and survive, they can be face to face with any man uh, and the whole, or even the whole world uh, and survive, be protected, be delivered. Uh, Jacob Israel learned that it was useless to struggle. And when he was crippled in the flesh, he becomes strong in the faith. He finally had to set aside his own schemes. He had to set aside his own plans. Uh, everything was falling apart from his own ability, his own efforts, his own schemes, his own plans, his own uh, way of doing things. And he just had to cling uh, without any strength to, to the God-man uh, and ask him for a blessing. That's what the believing remnant's going to have to do out in that uh, tribulate, well, beginning here in our earthly ministry of Christ, on through that tribulation period and on into that kingdom. Jacob's prayer for deliverance was met with a face to face encounter with God in the person of the, you know, the man God. Remember, it comes on, you kind of, as you read the passage, 
uh, in Genesis 32, it kind of develops. At first, it sounds like just a man, uh, but by the time you work your way through the passage, you realize it's, not, it's a man who's also God, a pre-incarnate appearance of the Lord Jesus Christ. Uh, and now, what's happening in his earthly ministry in John, and especially here in John, uh, is an incarnate appearance of the God-man. Uh, God himself in the flesh. Uh, and he's uh, given them this face-to-face -face encounter with him. So what I would suggest uh, is, with all that kind of now tied together, all that background, all that history, uh, perhaps Nathaniel, that's a question everyone asks, every commentary I have, everybody wants to know what was Nathaniel thinking under the tree or what was he doing under the tree uh, that so shocked him that Jesus knew that uh, it caused him to, uh, to proclaim Christ as the Son of God, uh, the King of Israel. What, he might, what was he doing under that tree? And I'd suggest uh, is perhaps, based on everything we've been talking about, Nathaniel was praying <clears throat> under that tree, under that fig tree, for his uh, and Israel's deliverance uh, through that coming king and kingdom, the Messiah, the Christ, uh, ushering in the kingdom of righteousness, peace, and prosperity. That's the fig tree and the vine. Uh, and, uh, and God answered that prayer of Nathaniel's. Nathaniel's under that tree, praying that prayer, asking for deliverance. The nation's in ruin. They're captive by a vain religious system that's controlled by the Gentiles, that's controlled by Satan. The nation's in complete ruin, and he wants... He's praying for deliverance. Like Jacob prayed for deliverance from Esau, Nathaniel is pr praying for deliverance to God. And the God-man, the Lord Jesus Christ, it almost gives me goosebumps to say, uh, he heard Nathaniel's prayer. And he's answering it just like he answered it for Jacob. He's answering it with a face-to-face -face encounter with the man who's also God, the God-man, the Lord Jesus Christ. And Nathaniel shouts out, the Son of God, the King of Israel. Just a few verses before this, he said, what good thing can come out of Nazareth? And now he, he proclaims this magnificent, culminating testimony that says everything, the Son of God. Uh, the uh, king of Israel. I think uh, the Lord Jesus Christ, the son of God who came down from heaven, but when we get to Nicodemus's, when he's talking to Nicodemus, he says he's come down from heaven, but he's also still in heaven. He's God. He's everywhere at once. As a man, he's in a localized place in Israel. Uh, in the body of a, a, a human uh, by the name of uh, Jesus Christ. Uh, but uh, as God, he's also still in heaven. And you have Nicodemus, or excuse me, uh, J uh, Nathaniel under that fig tree, going through all the reading, perhaps have, I, they usually didn't have their own copies of the Bible, but they would have it in their minds, if not on paper, going through this account of Jacob, his two big thing, the two big accounts of Jacob sitting under his fig tree. He's looking up in the fig tree. And that reminds him of the Messiah and the Christ and the King and the kingdom. And he prays with God for deliverance and God. God, the Son of God, who's not only in Christ on earth, he's also still in heaven. He hears Nathaniel's prayer, and he answers it with a face-to-face -face encounter with the God-man. And that brings up, then, we get to verse 51 here. Uh, uh, go back to John 1. John 1, and that brings, we kind of make a complete loop, uh, and that brings us to the verse 51 here, uh, and that brings us back to, and verily, verily, I say unto you, this is John 1, 51, he says, I say unto you, that's Nathaniel, a singular you, but now look what he does when he makes his declaration, hereafter ye, now he's gone to the plural you, y'all in our southern dialect, y'all shall see heaven open and the angels of God ascending and descending upon the Son of Man. 
And now he brings to that second uh, activity uh, event in Jacob's life, the connection. This uh, son, uh, the one that Nathaniel just recognized as the son of God and the king of Israel, uh, is the intermediary between heaven and earth, the intermediary between God and men, the mediator, maybe that'd be a better way just to determine it, the mediator. Uh, and uh, now the uh, Nathaniel and the disciples here take the place of Jacob, they're looking at this, uh, and the ladder or the stairway is replaced with the Lord Jesus Christ. He's the one that the things of heaven and, uh, and the things of earth are gonna go up and down on. Uh, and he now uh, takes his uh, title, he claims a title for himself. Everything else we've had in the book of John has been someone else's title for him. John the Baptist had some titles for him. Nathaniel just had titles for him. Uh, Phil, Philip had titles for him. Uh, Andrew had titles for him. And now we have a title that Jesus gives himself that no one else mentioned yet. And that's this final one, uh, ascending and descending upon the Son of Man. Uh, and he claims that title for himself. So uh, Nathaniel, is, uh, he, his prayer is answered, I suggest, uh, with this encounter, face-to-face -face encounter with the God-man, uh, who's also the God-man, uh, the, the God as man and the Son of God, absolute deity who would bless him and immeasurably more than what Jacob Israel received uh, and it's going to happen through this title the son of man uh, and that's one of the titles we're going to have to spend uh, some time on next week uh, we're going to close out with this but just to kind of whet your appetite I'll just kind of we'll look at uh, the basic text that title comes from and then we'll pick it up there next time so through Jacob's struggling, just to kind of close off this uh, segment, through Jacob's struggling and then clinging, Jacob secured for the nation a new na name, Israel, uh, and uh, the promise of its ultimate victory and blessing. And it's going to come back to, uh, to the nation of Israel, and it's going to lead into this title that Jesus assumes for himself. When he identifies himself, he uses this term, this title, the, uh, for, the most, for a good part of the time, it's called the Son of Man. And with this title, uh, remember the disciples' account, when we looked at that on the, uh, after John the Baptist's testimony, uh, his final words to the, the disciples were the Lamb of God. Uh, and the disciples went off and followed Jesus. And uh, I'm not going to redo the whole Lamb of God thing, but we, I suggested that uh, looking at it from John's perspective, uh, that Lamb of God is that Ram Lamb of God. It's not a little lamb uh, under a year old that goes to the cross uh, to atone for sins, to take away the sin of the world. That, would, that never entered into John's mind. Uh, that, uh, it used in that way. And even John the Apostle later doesn't use it in that way. Uh, John the Apostle, John the, John the uh, Baptist, he uses it twice, and then it's not used again until you get to the book of Revelation. And there, John the Baptist, excuse me, John the Apostle uh, uses it over and over again. So you have Jesus goes back to that John the Baptist, Ram Lamb of God concept, and what he does is he takes that and he sets it aside. He takes the Ram Lamb of God title and he says, uh, that's not for my first coming. That's going to be for my second coming. The Ram Lamb of God with his seven powerful horns, seven all-seeing, all-knowing eyes, seven all-active accomplishing spirits that's going to come back, return, and destroy his enemies and deliver his friends uh, in vengeance, wrath, and judgment. And Jesus now, at the end of chapter 1, he's going to take that uh, Ram Lamb of God concept that John the Baptist said and pack it up in a box. And you're not going to hear about it again until you get to Revelation. And what he replaces it with, what he, uh, what he 
uh, puts in its place, supersedes, I guess that's probably uh, the best word, he supersedes that title with another title that Jesus is going to claim for himself. And that's that son of God, excuse me, son of man title. That's his self-designation. And I will just close uh, with this. That lamb of God title is used only two times, only in the Gospel of John, only on the mouth of John the Baptist. And it's not used again until the book of Revelation uh, when it's used at least 28 or 29 times. And that's not even including when it's used uh, when through pronouns. That's just you when the actual word lamb uh, is used there as a metaphor. And it's used all the, it kind of explodes on the scene in Revelation. Well, what's interesting is the Son of Man is the exact opposite. The Son of Man occurs 89 times in the Gospel accounts and only two times in the book of Revelation. It flips. His first coming is going to be centered on this little Son of Man title. His second coming is going to be centered on that ram lamb of God uh, coming in vengeance, wrath, and judgment concept. And it's all based on one thing. We'll close with this. Go to Daniel 7. Now let's just read where it is in Daniel that kind of forms the basis of all this. Daniel 7, and we will close with just by reading this verse. Daniel 7, verse 13. Daniel 7, verse 13. And we'll just to show where this son of, son of man title is coming from. I saw in the, in the night visions, and behold, one like the Son of Man, there we have our Son of Man title, come with the clouds of heaven, and, ca and came to the Ancient of Days, and they brought him near before him. And there was given him dominion and glory and a kingdom, that all people, nations, and languages should serve him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion, which shall not pass away, and his kingdom that which shall not be destroyed. Let's close with a word of prayer.